Welcome back. So we're going to talk about one of the most important topics in this course, namely ethics. So what are what's ethics? I mean, it sounds like something from a philosophy course, doesn't it? Well, ethics in the broadest sense, it's the study of good and evil, right and wrong, just and unjust. And of course, there's business ethics also, which is the study of good and evil, right and wrong, and just and unjust in business. Now, my friends ask me a lot of questions. Well, I, I don't understand ethics, morals, values, reality. How does it all fit together? It's something that's not really very well explained, so hopefully I can shed some light on this. Okay? What I want you to think about, and again, look back at classical philosophy. Look back at Plato. Plato describes what we call the theory of forms. The theory of forms explains how something can be general and particular in nature at the same time, and that's not really a conflict. Now, what does that mean that something is general and particular at the same time? Ask a friend, what is good? Okay. Good is an example of a value. Okay. And values are kind of a, a step below forms. Forms are objects of moral, mathematical, or logical thought. So we'll put a form up here. For those of you that are very interested in this, I recommend you take the follow-on course to this one. We'll talk an awful lot about Plato's theory of forms and how it applies to managerial ethics. So a form, that's abstraction of moral, mathematical, or logical thought. And kind of a step below that, you have values. Okay. So a form is so abstract, we can't even really name it. It's beyond human sensory perception. We have no way of describing what it is. But values we can, right? Values are things like, oh, good. Good, pretty, courage. I guess I should say like pretty character as opposed to a physical pretty, but like a pretty character or a beautiful character, beautiful personality, something like that. Um, anyhow, so those are examples of values, okay? Now, values can get even more specific. So we start talking about what is courage. Well, uh, you actually find that courage is situation, situationally defined. Okay, so courage could be um, saying what you believe. Courage could be going to a difficult job interview. Courage could be fighting a bully. So what is ethics exactly? I always looked at ethics as the link between these. Okay. So if you want to look at courage as an interview, if you have an interview as a situation and you want to know what do you do during the interview, well, I behave with courage, and that's my value, which reflects this abstract form. You look at kind of the study of these links. That's how I've always uh, looked at ethics. So while things have a general and a specific nature, Courage is, going to an interview takes courage, which is an example of a value in an abstract form. Okay. Ethics would tell you, well, how do I behave in a way that exemplifies courage during the interview? What will courage mean to me in this specific situation? How do I behave courageously now? Okay. So it's, it's the study of the good and evil, the right and wrong. It's kind of that road map as you start going up this kind of pyramid that is the theory of forms. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, business ethics is an even more specific subset of ethics, as I mentioned. So it's the study of good and evil in business. Okay? And we know that all people, including managers, face ethical conflicts at some time or another. And in theory, applying clear guidelines can resolve the majority of conflicts. However, we know in practice that no matter how thoughtful you are, 
and exemplifying courage in an interview and a belief and a fight. And they can be very specific. Well, this is courage when you go to a job interview. This is how you fight the bully on the playground. And, and you can come up and you can write it all down and everything. And then, bam! There's this other situation that you didn't think was going to happen. You didn't know it was possible. And now, all of a sudden, you have some sort of an ethical conflict again. Okay. Or if you were to tie it back to our models, think of the stakeholder model. We treat all customers with dignity and respect, whatever that means, right? Hmm, but do we also have to treat the supplier with dignity and respect? Well, I didn't know because you didn't put in a regulation. Okay. So as a manager, no matter how explicit you try to be, you'll always have an employee who either through ignorance or through, by, or, or through design will find some kind of way to weasel around um, and behave in a way that didn't really match your intent when it comes to ethical behavior. Okay, So clear guidelines can resolve many of the situations, but trust me, not all the time. Generally speaking, our ethical traditions do support these uh, same universal values that exist. Again, goodness, you know, being honest, um, respecting life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, uh, respect for natural rights, being fair, following the law. And these are very general things. Again, what does that actually mean? Okay. Now, when it comes to evaluating ethical principles, again, an employee may say, well, I didn't know. You didn't define it for me. However, when they've done something, they probably know it's wrong. Okay. What is goodness? Well, we can have a discussion about that. Yet we can also recognize very quickly that some actions are not good. Okay. We can't define it, but we know when in some way an ethical transgression has uh, occurred. Um, and some ethical issues you just don't even recognize. You don't even realize that there was a breach of ethics. So we've got a couple theories of business ethics. You've got the theory of amorality. And the theory of amorality basically says um, that businesses should be conducted without reference to the full range of ethical standards, restraints, and ideals in society. So you look at um, you look at business as a game. Okay, you can cheat in business, but you don't cheat in real life because business is a game. It's a separate set of rules and codes, and therefore it has its own set of values. Okay? If I were to give an example of a theory of amorality, some of you may have played the game Grand Theft Auto. Okay? When you play Grand Theft Auto, you're blowing up stuff, shooting, doing all that crazy stuff, right? And yet when you turn off the console, you don't go out and do those same things in real life, I hope. Okay? This is an example of theory of amorality in action. It's kind of composed within a game. Well, you think about, well, it wasn't lying. We were playing a game of poker. It's okay in poker, but then when you go home, you have to stop lying. Okay? So this theory of amorality. Then there's also this theory of moral unity. Theory of moral unity. So business actions are judged by general standards of society, not by a special set of more permissive standards. In other words, you can, whatever you do in business, you need to be doing also in your private life. So if you're doing, if you're cheating and lying and stealing in business, that is not okay because society generally sees cheating, lying, and stealing as morally reprehensible. So whatever you do in business should also be the same kinds of standards that you apply in government or society. The same rules apply at all times. Now we have a variety of kind of sources of ethical values in business. Uh, religion, philosophy, culture, and law. Now all religions and many political ideologies also um, generally believe that 
right and wrong is something that is definable, including in business. We know in Christianity, Islam, and a variety of religions, there is also very explicit guidelines of how you should behave ethically, not only in life, but also in business. So religion is not something about understanding the divine, but also kind of a guide to life, uh, including in business. Of course, philosophy has um, really always been discussing what is right and wrong in business. Uh, we talked quite a bit about that in one of our previous lectures, looking at uh, ancient Greek and Roman beliefs on uh, what is and is not appropriate in business. Um, and yet there's still a considerable amount of dispute between philosophers as to what is right or wrong. Um, early Catholic theologians, including Thomas Aquinas and uh, St. Augustine, you know, preached that humanity should follow God's will. Um, and so you need to behave correctly in your worldly activity if you want salvation after death. Immanuel Kant okay, also looked at uh, ways to find or explore these kind of universal uh, rules and objective rules and logic. Uh, Jeremy Bentham also talks about utility, which we'll talk about next time. Um, and then John Locke looked at kind of natural rights. People were born with certain rights that couldn't be taken away, irrespective of whether you were operating in a business, government, or society. We also have the realist school of ethics. So we know that um, realists are people that believe that both good and evil are naturally present in human nature. So we can't always be good all the time. We can't always be bad all the time. Um, Machiavelli also built on this, saying, well, you know, if it was for a good cause, then you can kind of take shortcuts and cheat to get there, even though that's kind of bad. As long as the ends are good, then it's okay. We'll talk a little bit more about that next lecture. Of course, cultural experience is also an important source of ethics. Um, every culture has their own set of values and, and, and norms and, and how they define acceptable behavior. And civilization has had different interpretations of what is right or wrong based on uh, our kind of stage. So you think about the hunting and gathering stage. I mean, that was a cultural society that typically valued might makes right. You had to survive, both against your, your peers, but then also had to survive against nature. Of course, in the agricultural stage, more uh, emphasis was placed on stability. And as people began to live together and in closer proximity over a larger, a longer period of time, you had to start to learn to respect your neighbors. Okay, that became part of ethics. Of course, in the industrial stage, you had a lot of uh, emphasis on the acquisition of material goods. And this kind of was, was a really influenced ethical behavior. And now that we're in the technology stage, it's also interesting to see how ethics are changing. It seems that uh, there's a big emphasis on quick fix ethics, uh, instant gratification. Although, hard to say how that will continue to develop. Now let's explore this idea of ethical variation in cultures. We've got two ideas. We've got ethical universalism. And ethical relativism. Okay. Ethical universalism and ethical uh, relativism. So ethical universalism says that uh, human nature is the same everywhere because certain rules apply in all cultures. Think about the forms. Forms apply at all times. Okay. Now, they, there's some room and variation of how these are interpreted, but um, that's generally uh, seen as that there's only one, one right or one wrong way of doing things at any given time. Then we've also got this other perspective, and that's ethical relativism. So ethical values are created by cultural experience. Okay? So different cultures have different values, and there's no universal standard by which uh, to judge which values are superior. And globalization has really caused a problem in this because certain corporations think that they actually know the right way, so it's universalism, and yet they're co coming into conflict with local or relativist cultures. Now, this dichotomy between universalism and relativism, I think, is somewhat artificial. Again, let's tie it back to Plato and the theory of forms. Plato would say, yes, there are universal values, 
but we as humans are incapable of ever interpreting them. So in reality, we actually have relativism. Okay? Here's the form that's universal. Here's some values that are universal. But in specific situations, fighting, interview, and standing up for what you believe in, those interpretations of courage are totally relative. Maybe I'll give a more interesting example. One of my uh, students actually came up with this, and hopefully um, it's helpful for you as well. Think about the fact that in certain countries, women are not allowed to drive. Okay. Now, we know in the U.S. women can drive. So this is an example of ethical relativism. Okay. Women should be driving. Women should not be driving. It seems that there's a conflict. Now, if you look at what might be the reason between women not driving in these certain cultures, and this was, this was explained to me by a student, it evidently had something to do with women's health issues. Okay. Now, in the West, even though we don't believe, we believe that women should have the right to drive, we also believe in women's health. So the general idea of women's health being important is the same, but our specific interpretations of that are different. Okay. Hopefully that example is somewhat illustrative. Okay. Law is also an important source of ethics. Now, laws are even like more specific here. We actually have kind of laws coming down. We have laws coming down somewhere there. Okay. So laws formalize or codify ethical expectations. So all that ambiguity that you had the belief, the interview, the fight that you do with the first time, you codify it, you write it down. You codify it and you write it down, and then you wind up setting uh, kind of formal expectations so that the next time you have an interview or a fight or whatever, you know, it's already codified. That the law states this is how integrity works in these X and Y, uh, Z situations. Now, corporations and managers also have their own kind of uh, laws or, or uh, regulations or procedures. And again, these are designed to deter illegal acts, punish offenders, uh, and possibly rehabilitate them as well. So when we come back, we will discuss um, damages, cultural expectations, and a couple other things before we wrap up this first part of ethics.